While the name has changed, the criteria remain basically the same. An emerging business is defined as one owned, operated, and controlled by one or more individuals who are at a disadvantage. That is a company that experiences difficulty in achieving business-related success in the Milwaukee area and meets certain economic and other criteria. Businesses like Hopwood Masonry of Milwaukee. It's a small minority company, been around for about 20, 25 years. We do residential, commercial, bricks, block, stone, chimney. We work with general construction, and we do some general contracting too. The new Finney Library is the current job site for one of Hopwood's masonry crews. This temporary wall was being built to show architects what the building will look like once they start brickwork on the structure. Hopwood certified his company with the city four years ago. It's a lot of good things come out of it. Figure if you bid a job for $3 million and they call for 18% minority or 25%, you know you can get 100,000, 200,000 worth of that, of that kind of work, you know. So on that job might be too big for you to general. So like one of the big boys general that. So, you know, you can get a piece of that. It's really a good thing because sometimes I had anywhere from 20, from 10 to 25 guys. You know, like if we're doing a big job and I do a lot of small jobs around, around town, sidewalk, curves, you know, tug point, and I do a variety of things. So I can keep at least 12 to 20 guys going in the summertime. So that's a good part about it right there. Yeah, it's a lot of paperwork, but it's pay off in the long run. It do. It do pay off in the long run. Because some of the guys, some of the job, like, if it wasn't for the DB, you couldn't get a piece of that. Does Hopwood consider himself to be disadvantaged? I look at myself as a man trying to survive. <laughs> you know, whatever it takes, I do it to survive, you know. And he says the name change from disadvantage to emerging business really doesn't matter to him, as long as he gets a piece of the pie. I don't care, as long as they call me. <laughs> I could be late for dinner, just call me, I'll be ready. Even businesses outside the city, like All County Electric Supply, can take part in the program. President Rhonda Cook says she saw certification with the Milwaukee DBE program as an opportunity, another way to grow her company. In business only eight years, she's been certified with the city for less than one year. We have um, a 17,000 square foot warehouse. We have an inventory of about a half a million dollars. And we sell to small contractors, a little bit plant maintenance and we're targeting getting into some of the larger contracts with the city of Milwaukee to hopefully grow our business and take it over the top a little bit more. We're kind of holding our own right now. Um, it gets my foot in the door with the larger contractors that have these specific set-asides for the city of Milwaukee that normally I wouldn't have an opportunity to quote or bid on. Some of the projects that we've gotten involved with in this past year have been with the Milwaukee Public School System, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District, the um, Third Ward River Walk, um, the um, City of Milwaukee YMCA. So we're we're getting we've got about a little over a hundred thousand dollars in sales in addition to our our annual sales that we've been holding on our own. So we're hoping with the, the opportunity is there and that's what we're looking forward to. The city has been great. The application process. Um, it's a little time consuming and a little bit of work, but if you put your paperwork together and get it in, the city has been very cooperative. Rhonda believes all county electric supply is unique in Wisconsin, a woman-owned electric wholesaler. She also says the certification as an emerging business gives her the chance to work with larger contractors. How does she view the name change from a disadvantaged to emerging business? I think that puts a much more positive aspect on 
on your certification. I mean, when you consider yourself a disadvantaged, it sounds so negative. It is negative in a way because to be a small disadvantaged business, you have to be economically disadvantaged, socially disadvantaged, educationally disadvantaged. There's different criteria. Um, economically, again, being the major one. And when you are a small business and you're just starting out, obviously, you have the huge debt, which you're trying to obviously dig your way out of. And the city with the certification is supposed to help those small businesses so that they can survive. And emerging just to me sounds like more opportunities. So I'm, I'm looking at, I'm a small business looking for opportunities to make myself successful. Back to the city of Milwaukee and the 14th floor of this downtown office building at 735 North Water Street. Victory Personnel Services, another participant in the Emerging Business Enterprise Program. It was a struggling central city business when Joseph Tucker started it 11 years ago. Four years ago, he moved the full service staffing agency downtown, a move he says was driven by his customers. We do temporary permanent staffing, temporary and permanent staffing, uh, to, for uh, primarily large to medium sized companies. Um, we also provide payroll services and we probably do more work with professional administrative uh, and technical folks. Tucker decided to look into certification with the city's disadvantaged business enterprise program as part of an overall business plan. First of all, I wanted to uh, take advantage of every opportunity that was available to me as, as, as an entrepreneur um, to, to see that my business was successful. Um, and certainly the city uh, minority business program was one of those resources that were available that I just wanted to take advantage of. Victory personnel staffing managers spend most of their time and effort working in the private sector. But being certified as a disadvantaged or emerging business does bring in some business. And Tucker says any program that helps bring more money into the minority population is helpful and he would recommend that others look into certification. Oh, absolutely. Um, Anything that's going to assist, I mean, for anyone who's, whether you're a minority or non-minority, um, any small business that starts out the gate right away, I mean, the odds are against you uh, succeeding. So I think you have to try to take advantage of, of everything that's out there that's going to help you get an edge. I think it's so critical to the success of the, of the total economic viability of the city as a whole. And while it may sound a little self-serving because I am obviously a minority business owner and obviously enrolled in the program, I could step away from that and just look at the data. And any, anyone should be able to step away from that and look at the data and recognize that we all collectively, as a city, we need to have a stronger um, economic base within the minority community as a whole. And Tucker says he approves of changing the name from disadvantaged to emerging business. I love it. I think it's, um, it's very appropriate. I, I, I always, um, I never saw myself or my business at, as, a, as a disadvantaged business. And more importantly, it, the perception that that carries in the marketplace is inconsistent with um, what I think um, the authors of that term really intended. I think the intent was, is, is, is this company at a disadvantage from the standpoint of being able to, uh, having access to the, to the right kind of resources and, and being, being able to put itself in a position to compete consistent with non-minority companies. That's a different kind of disadvantage as opposed to um, the quality of your services. You know, if, if you're saying you're disadvantaged, you know, then people will have perhaps an expectation that the quality of your, of your services are going to be, um, let's just say, less desirable. So uh, I, I, I prefer the term emerging.
Good morning, 211 Milwaukee at Impact. This is Matricia. May I help you? This is very, very important to the community to have these services. There is a maze of social services out there, and it's very complex. Who knows where to go for what these days in terms of the 3,000 plus programs and agencies out there? Well, 211 is a simple number to call. 211 is Milwaukee's access now to any sorts of social services. It's difficult sometimes for families and individuals to find the services that they need to, to get that direct connection and to get services. So what we do is make sure that that connection happens. And these community resource specialists try to make those connections 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Impact Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services coordinates the 211 system in Milwaukee County. It's been in business since the days of the underground switchboard in the 1960s. Throughout the years, we've taken on other human service telephone lines, such as the food, food line, uh, the W-2 line, statewide homeless line. We were then, because of that experience, selected as a vendor to provide the 211 service for the Milwaukee County area. Any person who is has a health or social service concern and they don't know where to turn to, they can pick up their phone and push 211, dial 211, and they will get one of our trained community service operators. And that individual will, will help them uh, identify the exact problem, the exact nature of the services that they need, and then we will refer them to a program that they qualify for and that will uh, deliver the service that they need. And in, on many occasions, it's multiple referrals. For example, someone might call that needs food, someone might call that needs clothing, or it could be a variety of issues for their family. Anything from clothing to their W-2 offices or whether or not they have insurance. So depending on what the issue is, if it's social services related, or it could be issues that are not necessarily social services related, but for some reason the person is having some health, family, or social services related issue, we're able to handle that call and, and get them the services they need in Milwaukee County. Well, I think what you should do when you apply for the EA grant, when you go down, also apply again for the food stamps because you are eligible for food stamps. You don't need a job with food stamps. It's when a person needs food stamps is when they don't have a job. The phone line is funded by Milwaukee County, the United Way, and grants. As many as 14 trained social service professionals can be on duty at one time, taking 300 calls a day, 6,000 in a month. They'll refer callers to more than 3,000 social service agencies, and they say you shouldn't be afraid to call. It'd be nice if somebody called when they first had concerns about their child with alcohol or drugs, rather than letting the problem get worse. Um, they could call us and we could get them connected with an agency that could help them immediately with that. Better to have someone call us who's on, who can't make the end of the month's rent rather than be evicted and then call and try to find some place to live. So we're all, all about early intervention as well. Is there anything else you need to help with today? Huh? What about food? I can get you the information where you can go to a food pantry. And actually this is a good resource period because not only do they have a food pantry, they have clothing. It's just a nice resource to check out. You see they have many things that may meet your needs. Okay, it's called the secret to solving a lot of community problems is keeping families intact. And but the process of keeping families intact is more difficult than people realize. There are all these services available, but access became an issue. Families didn't know how to access services. So the implementation was uh, to build a service that people could access simply by the three digit number. And then through that, they would have access to all sorts of health and human services. The 211 assistance is free and confidential. 75% of the callers follow through on the advice. Those who call are often asked for feedback. Customer survey, you can just say yes or no. It's basically we'll give you a call back in a week just to see how the referrals that I just gave you go as well as how did you like our service. 
And one of the be best numbers, I think, in addition to people being satisfied with the service that they got here, is that 99% of the people were referred to a service that they were eligible for. Customers tell us all the time, I was not able to get the service that I need. I wasn't, was not able to find the service that I need. And I didn't know you, that there were such services that existed out there. And we're able to talk with them and give them that information right away. A simple, easy, free number to dial, 211 and they get the services that they need. This is a community-wide service. It's available to anyone in the community. It's a free service and that it doesn't matter what your life circumstances are. We're here to assist in finding the kind of programs that people need. In digging up the old grass and laying new sod, these young adults are hoping to lay the groundwork for new careers, new opportunities. Landscaping the new commons at Park Lawn is among the many projects of the Corps, which offers educational and technical training. The Milwaukee Community Service Corps is a youth development and job training program for young adults aged 18 to 23. Uh, we're also starting to do some innovative partnerships working with MPS uh, partnership and alternative schools to target those who are 16 to 18. Our uh, target audience is primarily uh, at-risk individuals. Uh, we're finding that generally about 80 percent of our young adult participants, 18 to 23, are uh, high school dropouts and are chronically unemployed. So they have few choices in the labor market uh, and they come to us and we offer them uh, not only the opportunity to test their willpower and test themselves, but also to gain some very strong marketable skills and credentials that will leap them up to the next level in terms of earning power. Since it started in 1991, the Corps has trained more than 1,000 for careers and skilled trades as diverse as electrician and commercial truck driver. The members receive a minimum wage for a 40-hour week. Funding comes from the federal government and fees for services. One half of our program is things like you see here today, out in the field, uh, vocational skills, applying those skills that they learn, that they, they read about. Uh, the other half of the program is in the classroom, as I said, getting credentials um, in hazardous material handle, handling and emergency response uh, protocol, in industrial manufacturing education, basic shop, math, things of that nature. I want to help out Park Lawn. I want to do something for it. I mean, it's not about money or anything. It's, this is my home. And, uh, I like to protect it the best way I can. They give us the necessary skills that we need. They train us. They show us everything that we need to know. There. They teach it to us. They, they take their time. Control. Everybody learn at a different pace, like and they, they, they take their time to teach it everybody they their own way. But the training they're giving you will last you a lifetime. Keeping the Milwaukee River clean and free of debris is another project of the Corps in cooperation with the private sector, Port of Milwaukee, and the city. We couldn't do it without the city, and they are, have been instrumental in, in helping us um, be able to afford the equipment, and they're happy to have us do the staffing. Uh, that's where we come in, is doing the staffing and the daily operations and the training. Uh, the core members have to be here on time. They got to have their uniform on, uh, and you know it gives them a different slice of life. It shows them uh, that it's important to keep our city clean. It shows them that we care about being clean uh, and having a you know a clean river that we can stand to live by and work by every day. Uh, it shows them that it's important. You know, you only get a half hour lunch and you got to be at work on time and you have to wear your steel toe boots no matter what. And so we're trying to instill some, some of that work ethic that they may or may not come to the table with. Corps members are also involved this summer in a pilot flood reduction program. They're helping homeowners remove downspouts that send clear water into the sanitary sewer system. Actually about here too. 
Corps members can also be found at various construction projects. Here, renovating a series of garages for the Milwaukee Housing Authority. And it's not too different than housing construction. Uh, the mechanicals are not quite there um, in terms of HVAC, electrical, and plumbing, but nonetheless, the rough-in, the finish, the roofing, uh, the siding, all those are components of housing construction. And where it takes them is it gets them into the, uh, the construction industry, hands-on experience. They know how to use power tools. They know how to build and construct. And we've got uh, several contractors who are knocking on our door saying, give us trained people and we've got positions. A letter came in the mail talking about the Corps. They told about the education, how they help you out, job training and everything. And I became interested, came for the application out. Um, the rest is just history, you know, went to orientation, enjoyed what they was doing and how they was really trying to help the youth in the, um, Milwaukee. And I just had to get in, get in the program. It makes me proud, you know, that I'm actually doing something, you know, because it's kind of like volunteer work helping out the um, Milwaukee people. You know, it makes my mother proud that she know that her son is doing something, you know, when I can be doing a lot of bad things out in the street, but I choose, to, you know, to do good in the community. I want to um, become a journeyman, from a journeyman to um, a contractor, and in the process, get my um, probably bachelor's in business, you know, so I can own my own business, be a CEO, so I can hire youth people, you know. The Corps says it is following in the footsteps of the Employment Relief Program launched in 1935. In fact, at Park Lawn, it was the WPA which helped build the housing project in 1937. We consider ourselves an urban youth corps and the grandchild of the CCC, and so we're extremely pleased with the opportunity to work on this project and close the loop, that cycle of life, if you will, where we come back to address and improve the legacy of our forefathers. The neighborhood's name comes from the wooded park along its western border. There are a variety of homes here, from bungalow to boat. Built in 1926, not by a sailor, but a traveling salesman. Edmund Gustorf. Edmund Gustorf was the son of a Finnish, the, the head of the Finnish Merchant Marine. The Edmund B., now a local historic landmark, is based on a 1910 motorized yacht. Bill Korsh grew up just down the street, later bought a home on Cambridge where he lived for 43 years. I grew up in this block here, and so I grew up with this boat. I mean, I, I can't imagine, it, it, didn't, it wasn't unique, it wasn't different. I mean, I thought, everybody had a boat. <laughs> so I, it was no big thing. It became a big thing when he thought it might be torn down and replaced with apartments. He bought the 72-foot-long, one-bedroom home in 1985 as a rental property. It's a unique thing. It, it, you couldn't build it today. It, it, it's grandfathered, and, but you, you couldn't possibly build it with today's codes. And it's probably the only thing like it in the United States. It, it has a commanding view of the, of the river, especially in, in, in days gone by when the railroads went past here. All these trees were non-existent. That's all scrub that grew up and you could see the river. If the man who built the boathouse was eccentric, is the man who bought it? Well, probably because um, I was advised not to try to restore it. It's a financial <laughs> albatross, but I am glad I did it, I am. Cambridge Woods residents want you to know this neighborhood is much more than a boathouse. It has its urban side, almost entirely residential some multifamily, some shops and stores along Oakland Avenue. The woods provide a bit of rural living and offer residents a paved bike path and trails down to the Milwaukee River. One of the things that I really love about this neighborhood is the diversity that we encounter here from the students that uh, come from the UWM, what the close proximity here being two blocks away to the city workers, to the attorneys and the professionals, to the computer consultants that live in our neighborhood, to the retired um, ethnic couples. We have Russian, Greek, Chinese. Um, we really are all walks of life here. And um, this originally was a working class neighborhood, although as being on the east side, it's changed over the years and it's been absolutely a gorgeous place to live. 
um, along with the proximity not only to the lake as walking distance, but also to the Milwaukee River and the river trails and the bike paths that exist within the neighborhood. We have all kinds of tradesmen and artists that live in our neighborhood as well, and so that makes it very interesting. As you can see, their gardens and their creative eyes, they bring it to us. Cambridge Woods is a small area. Sherwood on the north and Locust on the south, the river on the west, Oakland on the east, the only through street. And so with that, the people here feel a little more safe and they don't feel the congestion of the traffic that some of the other east side neighborhoods feel. And we don't even get the volume of cars on our streets except for when university is in session. Milwaukee's mayor in 1856, John Stoll was born in New York State. He named a few streets after some favorite East Coast locations. You'll find Providence and Cambridge, Hampshire and Hartford. The oldest home in the neighborhood, originally a farmhouse, dates to 1872. Another longtime resident has lived there for 37 years. And what we found here and what, what is still there, even so there are quite a few changes here in the neighborhood. We wanted to live in the city but in an area where we, there would be trees and we would have a garden for, for our children. And so uh, that was definitely here. But we also wanted to, to live near a bus. We were interested in living together with people who are different from one another. So uh, not just Germans or not just, so ethnic diversity, racial diversity, and there are quite a few, uh, particularly because of, of the student population, uh, uh, people of, of all racial backgrounds too, and also economic background. Of course, the uh, green area, the Cambridge Woods, was also particularly attractive to us. So attractive that when Elsa retired from a career in biochemistry, she became director of the Urban Ecology Center at Riverside Park which she considers an important environmental attraction. If you go on a field trip, whether that's be in the tropical rainforest or whatever, it's interesting, but it's not particular for young people as educational as it's kind of your extended backyard. And if you don't know a thing, you can learn a lot just by all the plants we see right here. We don't have to go far. Schools like Riverside High are another important part of the area. One of the reasons that I, for example, volunteer at my age in schools, even so, you know, my kids are far away and I, I, I don't have anybody uh, in school, of course, is because it's an important part of a neighborhood. Among the challenges here, working with the many college students who rent duplexes in the neighborhood, working with nearby UWM and Columbia Hospital. While usually peaceful, residents did worry about traffic. Two unique traffic calming circles were installed and have mixed reactions. There's no yield signs or stop signs and they're a little bit uh, dicey to maneuver and as people come around them the first time they're not quite sure which way to go. There's no one-way signs. Um, but they've actually added to our neighborhood in a couple of fashions. One is they're now garden centers and the residents around that area um, maintain them. They have also have helped slow the traffic down a lot. Call it Cambridge Heights or Woods. Residents say their small area in a big city has a lot going for it. Carl Sandburg lived at the block. And it's a lot of his poetry concerns these, this river and these woods. The people feel welcome here. You know, I've moved, when I moved in here, literally all four of my neighbors were over within the first 48 hours shaking my hand, introducing themselves, and making me feel welcome here. An advantage of a diverse neighborhood it's also because you have different ages, people help you or you help them. That is one point uh, in the quality of life team we have that we, we connect resources, human resources and other resources with one another. So uh, there was never a reason why we felt as long as we lived here, we wanted to live anywhere else in Milwaukee.